Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the Princeton Review topics on developing your personal statement and making the most out of your experiences. I'm getting ready to get started, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone could see and hear me. And I wanted to thank you all for joining. You're all in listen only mode, as it said, but I'm here to answer your questions. So my goal is to get through all of the topics right now and then allow about 15 minutes at the end for really some Q&A. So if you have questions as I go through, just type them in the chat box below and I'll do my best to get back to you. So let's get started. All right, so, come on, there we go. First of all, who's me? My name is Dr. Anita Pascal. Um, those who may already know me around here, I go by Anita. I know I've got lots of initials behind my name. Guys, I have been doing this forever and a day. I've been doing it for over 20 years. Um, as you can see, I'm an MD. So I've been just like most of you guys. I've been that person really wanting to get into med school. And I've had the opportunity, and I was fortunate enough for over 14 years to actually advise students, pre-health students at the college level and I've also worked on and continue to work on five MD admissions committees and one osteopathic program. So I've had all perspectives. I've been that anxious pre-med that so many of us talk about and I've been the person who's advised you guys and known the types of things that you're up against and by the same token most importantly I sit on the admissions committee side so I really kind of get the people that we're working with, the things we hear and my goal is to really help you fine-tune who you are and and how you present that. So as a process of this, I have counseled thousands and thousands of applicants. Um, I actually have a medical degree from Chapel Hill. My background is reproductive health and family planning, OBGYN and family medicine. I actually worked for quite a few years for the World Health Organization. So I still have an office in Zimbabwe and Ghana and Haiti. Um, my work was doing contraceptive development and STD prevention in third world countries. Um, in addition, I have a master's in education and PhDs in physiology and pharmacology. Although I'm going to tell you guys, please don't be impressed because I really just didn't want to get a job. I liked school. Um, as a part of this though, I'm very well connected, not just in the medical, but also the healthcare community, kind of what we're looking for in today's physician. And I hope with that said that you guys, I know this year has been a really, really tough year for all of us, that you're doing well, surviving the pandemic and staying safe. Um, I personally, actually my entire family is involved in healthcare, so not just myself. Um, my children are healthcare providers in the emergency room. So they have definitely been right at the front line. So what I'm really hoping to accomplish today is really to give you some pointers on developing your personal statement and your experiences. We're going to talk just a second about the timeline for developing your application. But before we get started, one of the things I want to do to sort of help me is I'm going to do a poll to figure out where you guys are in the applying process. We're going to talk a little bit about what you should be doing now, be it if you're going to be planning to apply this May and June or even in the future to get ready for that. I'm gonna give you some basic tips to maximize both your personal statement and your experiences. And I know a lot of you guys go, why is that so important? And one of the things I see the most in the students that I work with here at the Princeton Review and actually through all my years is everybody gets fixated on their personal statement. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is although your personal statement is, is important, and don't let me underplay that, that it's not important, it is, but ultimately, it's probably one of the least important parts of your application, and I'm going to explain why, but I'm also going to explain how you can maximize that. So before I get started, let's do that poll so I can figure a few things out and I know who I'm working with. So first of all, if you could tell me when you're planning or hope to apply, which means have you guys already applied? Maybe you're looking at the potential that you may have to be reapplying this coming year. Are you applying this upcoming cycle or are you applying in the future? So looking for what I'm seeing, good, I got nobody who's wavering between, you might be reapplicants. So we're really looking at people who are getting ready to apply this May or June when the application opens, as well as a few of you guys who may be the next cycle. So this is awesome because a lot of folks often tell me like, why are you starting now? 
why are you working with people right now? Well, I will tell you, I love to get the kids that I work with the year before, well before we even get to this part, because my students who are working with me right now will tell you that we actually start in November, December, brainstorming personal statements. My students right now are expected to get me their first draft of their personal statement and their experiences this month and the first of next month. I know applications don't open until May, but the number one mistake I see on the admissions committee side when I see things coming through is clearly people who waited to the last minute. I'm going to tell you your personal statement and your experiences are not written overnight and they're not developed in a couple of weeks. These are things that should be developed just like you work on the MCAT for five to six months before you test. You should do the same thing with your personal statement and your experiences. I'm going to tell you how to maximize that. So Let's look at our typical timeline. Like I told you guys, I start working with my folks. I expect between ne November and January, we should be drafting our personal statements, putting together our experiences. I'm going to tell you the best tips for doing that. And actually, you should have already started requesting your letters of recommendation. Now, it's not uncommon for the kids I work with who are with me for two and three years, because oftentimes I counsel folks from their freshman year all the way through so that we can build that complete application but they'll request letters of recommendation as they're going along so that their professors know them. But if you're planning to apply this year, you should start at least by January reaching out to people asking for letters of recommendation. I always tell my folks, give an April 30th deadline because the application opens in May. That way, if you got the stragglers, because people are always behind, you've got the rest of the month of May to get those letters in. Now, do you have to have all your letters in before you submit your application? No, but a lot of schools will not consider your application as complete if you don't have all of those letters in or until you get them in. So right now, what I tell people is think about who you are as an applicant. And I'm really, more than anything, I've got to put this in perspective because this is a trade-off. Oftentimes, one of the first things I do with a student is I sit down and I say, tell me why you want to be a doctor, but you cannot use the following words. You cannot use, I want to help and serve. I want to make a difference. I really like science. I want to change people's lives or my grandma or somebody in my family died and I want to make sure that, that never happens again. Now, I, I don't want to get, I don't want you to get me wrong. Okay, all those things are important. And actually, those are the reasons you should want to become a physician. Okay, but you've got to understand it is like the same old, same old, same old, tired and busted. I want every one of you guys to think about the commercial that you see over and over and over on TV right now. Right now, it's that stupid commercial. I can't even tell you what it's about, but it's got that stupid emu. And it was really kind of cool the first time I saw it. But now I am so tired of seeing that bird and that guy that I could like, I can't even tell you what the commercial's about because we don't watch it. Think about that the same thing on the admissions committee side. Applications this year alone are up almost 17%. And I can already tell you at the admissions committee side, we're cranky because we're, most of us are working remote. We've had to completely revise the way we look at applications because we've got virtual interviews, conversations, we're all overwhelmed. Applications are up and it's a sea of a lot of the same things. Now we are expecting to get from reading your personal statement and your experience that you want to do all those things I just talked about, but you've got to articulate it from a much deeper level. I'm going to explain that in just a second, but let's go back to what we're doing. So with that in mind, the average med school is going to get around 10,000 applications, 10,000. And I will tell you at a lot of the schools that I work with, we're approaching 17 and 18,000 applications this year. We've got to weed through those to get down to maybe three to 600 we're going to interview. Think about how exhausting that is on the med school side to even just interview those, but we've got to whittle all those applications down to those we're going to interview and from those we're going to interview to the maybe 100 to 250 that we're going to offer a slot to fill our, our class of 100 to 150. So those are very small numbers, okay? 1% chance. So how do you get through that? And the first is knowing who you are as an applicant, what makes you different, and what are you going to do to catch our eye? So 
you got to remember point number one. It's going to be on a screen. It's going to be on an electronic screen. And you've got to be real with yourself. Do I have the numbers to get me through? And we all know this. MCAT and GPA. I don't ever have to tell a, a pre-med to focus on their MCAT and their GPA because unfortunately sometimes that's more what they're focusing on. They are head down studying 24-7 to get that great GPA. I deal with it every day. At least once a day somebody will message me and go, oh my goodness, Dr. Pascal, Anita, yes, what? I'm going to I'm going to get a C in chemistry. My world is over. No, your world is not over because the average admitting GPA to med school is about a 365 to a 375. That's a really good GPA, but that also means that student has not gotten an A in every single class that they've taken. So the world does not end over one B or one C or even a couple of them. Now, a bunch of Ds, a bunch of Fs or whatever you need to rethink, you're gonna need to add on to that. So if your GPA is lacking or not competitive, you've got to decide, do I look at options? Do I add master's programs? What do I need to do to get to that next level? Same thing with your MCAT. This is something over and over. People don't invest enough time in preparing for it. And the second, and probably the biggest thing I see is they don't do enough practice tests. They approach the MCAT like, I got to relearn everything. That's not the way the MCAT's designed. It is designed to take a topic, to be able to evaluate it. The first two questions, most anybody could answer. Two additional questions, you have to have core information. The last two, you're gonna have to take it a step further. And you get to that point by doing lots and lots of practice tests and reviewing them and lots and lots of problems once you've reviewed. I don't know at the number of students that I encounter who come to me and who say, I'm testing in two weeks. I say, what are your practice test scores? Um, I got a, I got a 502 and a 498, but I feel like I'm really going to be there. How many practice tests have you taken? Two. Guys, your MCAT is like a marathon, and you should approach it just like that. You should train and build your endurance. So the first two screens are going to be your GPA and your MCAT. So as you consider and look at schools, figure out, am I in that range of what they're looking for? Now, you may be a little below or a little above, and I did an admissions timeline um, webinar in October. Check it on our webinar site where I talk about the stats and the parameters that you're looking at, but be very realistic. I oftentimes get people who go, I need to get into a top 10 school, and I say, do you want to go to a top 10 school or do you want to go to med school? Because I'm going to tell you, your residency placement is going to be most often based on your clinical letters and how you perform on your boards. Just like people think, I had to go to the best school in the country to get into med school. We're not screening on that institution. We're screening on those scores. There are too many people. Now, the second score is we don't just go from the screen and read your personal statement. That's why I say sometimes it's not the most important part of your application we go to your experiences and your experiences are going to also be an electronic screen. AMCAS has what they call their core competencies and we are looking for how many of the AMCAS categories you use, do your descriptions reflect those competencies and how much exposure do you have in each of those areas and it literally weights it. How much research, how much clinical, how much service, all of those parts. So that's why when I say you need to look to be that well-rounded applicant that brings the solid GPA with the solid experiences that will get you through those screens where then I look at that personal statement. Now, I can tell you that never in my 20 plus years of doing this has anybody walked out and went, we've got to accept this person off this personal statement. Now there are personal statements that go, yeah, I'm not sure we wanna interview this person anymore, 
or there have been compelling personal statements that have pulled us to say, I'd like to see what else they have to offer, but never has it been the end all be all. So make sure that you give appropriate weight to everything, which means weight your experiences as much, if not more, as the effort that you put into your personal statement. So with that said, that's why I have my folks drafting their personal statement and experiences right now. And we'll do a second draft in March and a third draft in April. What that means is when their applications open in May, all they have to do is sit down, key, and submit their application when they open. Now, the other thing to remember is that when the application opens, you want to make sure you're getting your other stuff together, including your letters and sending your transcript. As we know, you'll submit your primary application in June. People get all wiggy-diggy about this, okay? Schools don't see anything about you in June. June is strictly to allow the um, application services to verify your applications which means you want them thorough, you want them completed, and you want them submitted, ideally when they open, but no later, if at all possible, by around June 15th. A lot of this is going to depend on your MCAT testing. Again, refer to the webinar I did back in October. But on that same line, applications will be opened to schools, meaning they will see where you've applied in July. This is when you'll start getting your secondaries. Here's another important thing to understand. The average number of schools is around seven to 15 that people apply to. My students is somewhere around 20, but currently about 90, this year actually 95% of schools automatically generated secondaries, never even looking at your application. And if you read their websites closely, you will see that many of them actually disclose that if you do not meet their screening criteria, your application will likely not be considered, which means we'll give you a secondary, you're welcome to pay us to submit your secondary, we may never look at it. That does not guarantee that. You have to meet those criteria. Again, secondaries are generally intended to gain greater insight into who you are and how you relate to their school. Typically in an average year, most interviews start around August and will run into January, February, a few into March. This year, due to the pandemic, we know that's all been scaled out. A lot of schools are really just ramping up their interviews in December and starting now. So again, really keep everything in perspective, listen for information. We often say that people will send letters of continual interest to schools they haven't heard from around November to December, as late as February of the year you're applying. But the problem is people often wait way, way, way too long to get started on this and they either rush their personal statement, they get to their experiences and remember, oh crap, I'm missing all this, or they delay submitting their application because they're behind on this. So how do you get around that? So key points to remember when writing your personal statement. So again, I said, you write, you rewrite, you let it sit, you write again. Okay, my daddy was the epitome of this. What he always said was, write something out, set it down to 24 to 48 hours, come back, read it again. Okay, because if you read it right away, your brain, and we know you guys have all seen those puzzles where like it says, find the words and all of these, you know, this display, it's what your brain can see. You may miss those simple things. And here's another tip that I give folks. They often read, write their personal statements, then they ask all their family and friends to read it. Okay, we know you, okay? I get personal statement after personal statement and I'm going, what the heck are you talking about? Who is this person? How did you get there? Because we don't have all the background information. I can tell you, if you're fortunate enough to make it through those screens and I sit down and I read your personal statement and I'm just like, what? Or it's full of, I am very compassionate. I want to be a doctor, blah, blah, blah. We'll tune it out. We'll move right back. So you will become the emu in that commercial. Okay, so you really, really want to make sure that you articulate a story that tells your journey. So where does that start? I always tell my students, sit down, make like a list of things that are important in your life. And I will tell you for me, when I sat down and I thought about 
writing my personal statement. And for those of you who know me, I did not go to college with any thought of going to med school. I was actually an architectural design major and a chemical engineering major. I want to talk to you guys about that because engineering was so not my thing. But about my junior year, I really sort of felt that maybe architectural design wasn't the fit for me. I worked to put myself through college. So I worked three different jobs to put myself through college as a tutor and as an RA, but I also worked in a hospital. And it ultimately would be that job in the hospital. I didn't work in the hospital because I thought I was going to med school. I actually worked in that hospital to pay my bills. But it would be sort of that connection I developed with patients that would sort of make me think, and I was just like so many of you guys, I want to help, I want to serve, I want to make a difference. I, I, that was me. That's where I was like, I got to find a different career. Hey, this medicine thing kind of works for me. And I actually have a video that I do for my students where I talk about that I had been working in this burn unit at the hospital for about almost four years. And I, I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. I was starting IVs. I was doing burn debridement. I was taking care of wounds. And I, I thought I had it all, everything I needed to be the, the great physician. And the summer that I applied, and I had already submitted my application stuff, we had a late night call where a young couple who were coming home from their honeymoon, um, we heard they were coming into the burn center. Basically, they were coming home from the airport and a drunk driver crossed the center line and hit them head on. When at the impact, the husband, the husband was ejected from the car, but the wife was trapped. So he crawled back to try to pull her out. And in the process of trying to pull her out, she actually sustained minimal injury. He was burned over 75% of his body. And so we actually ended up having him in our burn unit for over two months. And for any of you guys who have heard a lot of the COVID stories about people being on ventilators and things like that, it's a very horrifying plight for these folks. So this guy had been in our burn unit for over two months. And at the end of those two months, he had gotten to a point where he had come back enough that we thought we could take him off the ventilator. And I remember I called his wife, she came in and that particular day she was sitting beside his bed and I was changing the dressings on his arm while they were talking. And guys, it was the coolest thing because they were reminiscing about their honeymoon. They were talking about future plans and everything. And I remember them talking about having kids. And he said when they would go on vacation, he'd have to wear like a full body suit to protect himself from the sun. And as they talked about everything, I remember thinking, this is why I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to help. I'm going to serve. I'm going to make these people better. This is what I do. And then I remember that he looked at her and he said, I'm really, really tired. Could you go get me a milkshake from the cafeteria? They make protein milkshakes to help them get better. And his wife, like she puffed up, she got all excited because she was going to do something for him. And so she was like, absolutely. And she said, baby, I love you. I'll be right back. And she went out the door and actually the elevator doors were right outside of our, our room right there. And so she pushed the button. And I remember watching him watch every step she took and the door opened and she turned around and she saw him looking at her and she blew him a kiss and she said, I love you. And I heard him whisper, I love you too. And by this time, tears are streaming down my face while I'm eavesdropping on them, right? And as the doors closed, he turned around and he looked at me and he said, I have no idea who you are. And I remember how raspy his voice was from being on the ventilator. He said, but I know that you've probably been here and I just want to say thank you. And I was like, yeah, see, just me, I'm going to be a doctor. And he said, thank you for helping me. And then he turned his head to the side and I heard him take a really deep breath. And then his EKG went flatline. He coded right there in front of me. I pushed the button, they ran the code and they ended up pronouncing him before his wife got back upstairs. I still, like even telling that story today, I remember how I felt. I, I know I clocked out. I did not, I took the next two days off because I had to do some serious soul searching as for, was this the right career for me? Cause I was like, I'm not sure I can do this. 
So when I came back to work, my attending pulled me aside and he said, you really do not get it, do you? And I thought, and I'm going to lose my job. And I said, what do I not get? And he said, I know you want to go to med school. You've made that decision. And he said, and honestly, you're probably the best, one of the best medical assistants we've ever had. He said, but I listen to you talk about help and serve and make a difference and all those things. And he said, medicine is not about you, honey. It's not about your cures. It's not about our medicines. It's not even about patients. He said, that was a patient but it was a person who died. And it was a person who left behind a wife who didn't get to say goodbye again. A mom who didn't make it to the hospital to hug her son one last time. They actually had a little dog and I always think about, cause I'm this huge animal lover, a little dog who wonder why he never came home. People with lives, and he said, and in our job, in what we do, we get to develop relationships, make connections. And if we're lucky, we get to make a difference in the lives of people. But when they leave our office or our hospital, they have lives going on outside of that. And the work we do help them in that. So when you write your personal statement, you think about the things in your life and the things you've done and the experiences you've done that help you demonstrate that. And that will get a powerful personal statement that shows us that you get it. Don't tell me you're empathetic. Don't tell me you're compassionate. Demonstrate it in the stories you do and the things you've done. So once you've written it, back off those cliches that I want to help, I want to serve, I like science, somebody died. We hear that, we get that, but the way you articulate that and the way you demonstrate it will echo much better. Because again, I've seen and I've heard that emu so many times, I will tune that out if you don't truly demonstrate it and take me there. Now, oftentimes I get people who go, but it's only 5,300 characters, including spaces. You're right, it is. And there's a reason we do that. We don't expect you to tell your life story. You've got secondaries, you've got experiences, you've got interviews to do that. We expect you to be able to articulate from your gut how you got here. Now, be interesting. I will be willing to bet that you guys may not remember a lot of the things that I tell you today. But if you tell a story that catches my attention, and we always say that the strongest personal statements are like the movie trailer that you wanted to go see. Think about it when we used to could go to the movies before the pandemic, or think about when you're watching Netflix and they're teasing you with some upcoming shows. There's that catch, that trailer that goes, I, I want to watch that. I want to know what's going on. So be interesting. Create a catch that gives a reflection about you and then get ready to tell me your story and your journey. We are looking for your view of the world. Be interesting. Show, don't tell. I cannot emphasize this enough. Okay. Go back through your personal statement. Look at how many times you use the word I. And I can tell you on the admissions committee side, it is like sticking a needle in our eye. I, 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 I. Try not to start paragraphs with I ever. Limit the number of times you start sentences with I. Avoid and use better wording or grammar, such as don't say, I got an opportunity. I said, I had an opportunity. Watch words and how you phrase them. Use an active or moving tense. Okay. And use things that don't just say it, demonstrate it. And here on Inauguration Day, and by the way, I thank all of you guys who are joining me, don't play the politician role. Don't say it, prove it, okay? Oftentimes when I have people who will go, I really learned compassion from working with such and such. Yeah, um, I, we're gonna fix the world, I'm gonna fix the economy, I'm gonna fix taxes. Don't tell me, demonstrate it. Show me how you're gonna do it. Don't ramble. At times, it almost feels like you're trying to use up characters and it gets confusing. And a rule of thumb, okay, if you've typed it out in 11 point font, and by the way, don't go below that, 
If you've typed it out in 11 point, point font and you've gone more than three lines, your sentence is way too long. Break it up. The brain cannot comprehend and focus on that. Cut it down, make it something that will keep me engaged. I don't need to read a dissertation. All right, address your weaknesses and move on. And I wanna temper that by saying a lot of secondary applications will say, is there anything else you wanna to talk to about in the com to the committee about? And by the way, I'll do a webinar in July on secondary essays but you will have opportunities, be it in secondary essays, to explain those things. Now, if there is something glaring, if you have a significant drop in your GPA due to an illness or a reason why you had to take withdrawals or something like that, you have a limited amount of space, acknowledge it, address it briefly, and move on. And I always, always, always say, accentuate a positive always reflect from it. So for instance, maybe you applied before and you're reapplying. I always say as a reapplicant, you need to address that in your personal statement. And that doesn't mean make your whole application about it. But what you should do is maybe have a reflection at us in the end. Like as I reapply this year, I am thankful for the additional time where I have learned X, Y, and Z. And then you can address it and move on. Watch your transitions. There are often times where I'm reading personal statements and we're in the heat of them right now where I cannot, there are enough breadcrumbs to get me home. We start with a thought. And again, when we talk about your personal statement should have a catch, three to four paragraphs in it that sort of tell your journey. Ideally, one of them is going to have a clinical focus. Hopefully something's going to impart some aspect of service. It is a very, very service-driven career. So we expect to understand you've got a heart for service and that we can transition between where you go with your opening to get that flow and to get to a concluding paragraph that oftentimes reflects back to the beginning and gives a challenge going forward, but include a transition that takes me from that last paragraph to the next one. Vary your sentence structure, your length. Don't make every single sentence three lines long because we just can't manage that. All right use the active voice and please don't write in third person. I, nothing is more annoying than to have somebody speak in themselves in third person. I, I don't, and oftentimes I feel like people sit down with a thesaurus, thumb through the words and throw them up on their personal statement. I'm literally like, where did you get those words? You didn't even spell it right. We're not looking for reading Chaucer's or Dante's Inferno. We're looking for an engaging, well thought out personal statement that tells a story. This seek multiple opinions, I cannot underscore. Before you submit, don't just seek the opinions of friends and family, submit from, get opinions from people who don't know you very well. The other thing is oftentimes I have people who get their writing centers to review their personal statements, and that's actually really good for grammar, punctuation, and flow. But oftentimes career centers are more used to reading statements reflected for job applications, not personal statements like for med school. So make sure that you keep that in mind and take it with a grain of salt, as we so to say to speak, but make sure they can follow and understand what you're trying to convey. Focus. Your personal statement should highlight interesting things about your journey. So sit down, outline your personal statement. Don't be lazy, okay? Outline it, put your structure, tell the journey, take things out. Remember, it does not have to be everything. We have experiences. We got three most meaningful. You got secondaries. You have opportunities, but give us a sense of you. So with that in mind, the four R's are write, rewrite, I know it's not an R, revise and repeat till you get it right, which means why you start now, why you think about who you are, don't put this off until May and be standing there like a deer in the headlights going, I don't know what to write. So watch your word count, take a systematic approach, tell that journey, Write out a journey of your life experiences. Find the ones that might be most meaningful for you. Outline it and then use that five to six paragraph approach. What I generally tell people is start with 
that meaning in mind of 5,300 characters, write everything out, shooting to get to no more than 63 to 7,300 characters. Then go back and maybe pick a paragraph or two that go, you know what, I can put that in my experiences, or that's too much detail, and then maybe condense down. For me, for my students, I always say, you've got to be 6,300 or less, because if I'm cutting out a 1,000 characters, I can change the whole meaning of your personal statement. So the closer your target is to that 5,300, the better you are to work with. Now, let's get to those experiences. I knocked out the personal statement first because that's the one everybody gets so wigged out about, but I can't tell you guys enough how important your experiences are. So AMCAS gives 15 experiences, three will be your most meaningful. For a Comus, you list your 15 experiences. There are, not, are no most meaningful. For Texas, you just list pretty much every experience, but they now have asked for your three most meaningful as well. So we're really looking to reflect on things that will be pivotal for you. And ideally, we're hoping that one of those is going to be clinical and one will be service because they are so important in your journey. I will also tell you that if you have extensive research, and the funny thing was, Last year, the average hours of research was 1,425 hours. I don't even know how people acquired that many hours. I mean, to me, that was astounding, and I did four years of research in college. When we looked at clinical experiences, there was an average of about 350 hours, with more ranging about the median was about 500, combining shadowing and paid clinical. Because we're actually seeing now about 60% of students are taking a gap year either to work on academics, but what we're seeing more and more are students taking that additional year to get greater, more in-depth service and to truly get paid clinical. I can tell you, and I'm gonna tell you this out the gate, the med school level, we're not impressed with, oh, you graduated in three years, whatever. We are looking for the kid who has stepped outside the academic bubble and who has really, and as my favorite Dean used to say, rolled up your sleeves and got in there and did medicine. Now, we're not expecting you to do up in heart surgery, but we would like to see if you're planning on committing your life to this medical journey that you actually understand what healthcare is like, and that's more than I want to help and serve, or I stood behind and I shadowed somebody, because we, that, you can get a sense of medicine, you can get a sense of whether or not you get wheezy and pass out in an operating room, but you don't get a sense of what the day-to-day -day life is truly like, or the patient experience, or the physician experience, or the diagnostic experience. So working as an MA or an EMT, or the big go-to right now is a scribe because they feel like you have to work through the diagnostic process, not only gives you insight into healthcare, but it gives you real world life, not just studying 24 seven, working and interacting with other people, holding a job, paying bills. And if we ever get out of this pandemic, maybe gaining personal travel, cultural exposure, understanding what life is outside of just the people that you went to school with, because you're gonna be working with a lot different people than that. So one of the things that we tell you is look at the AMCAS 15 core competencies. Okay, again, looking at all the things they say, and here's one of the issues. People often say, do I, do I not have to have research? Research is not required. However, if you notice this thinking and reasoning competencies, many admissions committees feel like this is really only truly acquired through hands-on lab didactic critical thinking research experience. So some exposure, typically we say research should be a minimum of semester, ideally a year, but even summer exposure can count to something like this. It's just not gonna be as meaningful. Definitely wouldn't be one of your 15 most meaningful, but three most meaningful, but a way to get to it. So we are looking at when we go back and we read your experiences, and actually now two of the schools that I work for before we can grant an interview, actually have a sit down look at all of the experiences and check off if their experiences and their stories and summaries demonstrate all an understanding of all of these things or that they at least have participated in it. 
Now, one of the struggles I fig struggle with is 15 experiences and 15 core competencies. These are not a one-to-one, -one, guys. Several of these will overlap. There will be, you may have one that has eight of these and one that has none. OK, um, it's really just an understanding that you make sure you demonstrate these, because, again, remember, it's an electronic screen. So the first thing I tell my students is sit down and make a list of everything you've done from the summer after high school going forward. High school things do not count unless you started it in high school and you continued it into college. OK, so a lot of folks have done a lot of stuff and that's great. You can talk about it in secondaries, but not on your application. Um, the two that are are the Gold Award and um, Eagle Award for Scouts. But again, as a general rule, we're really looking at those. Write everything you've done. A strong application will be balanced in all the categories with links of time and exposure that will demonstrate all of these competencies and is well-rounded in academic, clinical, service, leadership, and outside interest. So academic includes research, study abroad, tutoring, language competencies. I can't underscore that enough and actually using them out in the real world. Clinical, both shadowing and paid on clinical. Clinical diversity in different settings, indigent care, internationally. And I realize where we are in the pandemic. Get out, do virtual shadowing, volunteer your time. And if you're not there, schools say over and over and over again, hold your application because we need to know, you need to know. Service, have you done the time to do dedicated long-term service that puts you outside your comfort zone where you grow as a person? Have you developed leadership capabilities that you can demonstrate in the real world? Understanding and knowing all of these things and how it fits in. So if you list out all your experiences and you're having to combine them to fit them into 15, you may be where you need to be. Now that means not listing every hobby you have, not listing every shadowing experience separately, because I have my folks group their shadowing together so it's a longer length of time and more hours so they can be reflected. If you have less than 12 experiences, you need to think seriously about backing up and taking a gap year because I will tell you it is much better to be the prepared applicant than the reapplicant. Many schools don't review the first year after you apply. Many schools say we're no, you need to fix all the reasons you didn't get in and many schools have stricter screening standards for reapplicants. So in your experiences, you will be asked to list the type. Again, make sure that you hit the key categories. Give it an experience name. Think long and hard about this. Give it something that will give us some indication of what you've done. And because you're gonna be limited in your categories and your experiences, we say, Put the full words up here and then give it an acronym. So let's say you're a mentor with big brother, big sister, then call it BBBG, I mean BS, in parentheses up there, then you can use the initials and save characters in your writing. Then take a look at your dates and time, remembering things that are ongoing. You can estimate hours going forward through August of the year that you are applying, the year after you're applying when you would matriculate, but you cannot list future experience. Experiences, all right. Make sure to have all of this information. Again, if somebody has retired or whatever, we need to make sure that we have a good contact name. If they passed on, it's okay. We understand. You're going to have 700 characters to demonstrate what you learn. Same thing here. Be meaningful. Skip the use of I. Look at we. We're looking for collaborative um, information you will have 1325 in your most meaningful so generally we say use one statement to state what the organization was what the project or the position was something that you accomplished and how you grew through it please 
please avoid. From this experience, I learned. This experience taught me. If I hear that experience word one more time, 15 times over and over, 10,000 times over, you become an emu. Also, stop trying to av or avoid things like, it will help me as a physician. I will learn as a. So you want to articulate this without using that same tried and true words. So describe what you did, not the generic position. Again, sometimes like maybe with research, you may be able to list leadership. You may be able to list tutoring or teaching attributes that you did in it if you discuss it in your experience. Focus on your passions, not the organization, what you learn from it. Do not write just the sake of filling up the box. You got 700 characters does not mean you have to use all 700. Sometimes less is more. Be sure to include how you improved and grew through it and describe how this fits into your understanding, such as it enabled me to become a better communicator, a better listener through blah, 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 blah. And if possible, use a story to illustrate. Maybe you tutored underserved kids and you have somebody that you want to reflect on how you knew you were breaking through to them. The smile on their face when they bounded in that day telling you how they had been successful on a test and how that made you feel. So list and organize, make a list of everything that stands out, put the category, the length of time, figure out, group and regroup from where you are. If you have 15, more than 15 combined, less than 15, recheck, maybe you're missing something. Less than nine, maybe not enough. I really say less than 12. Less than nine, you should not be applying. Just say no to high school, only unless you continued it into college. Strive for accuracy. And this is really important. I say we haven't been following you around so you can give us better insight. I don't want to say embellish, but you know where I'm coming from. But it may come up in an interview and you better be able to know what you were doing. Be selective about your most meaningful. Again, if you've done tons of research and you don't have a, a research letter and you don't make it a most meaningful, it's going to raise some flags for us. We'll need to understand why. Again, look heavily at service and clinical, not required, but ideally one of them should be clinical. You want to be a doctor. Okay, switch up your wording. Again, limit the use of I. Stay away from, this will help me as a physician. And again, avoid the use of doctor, use physician whenever possible. Use we whenever possible, not I. And stay away from, from this experience I learned. Show growth, advocate for yourself. Like I said, this experience enabled me to hone my communication skills so that I now am much more comfortable interacting with patients. Maybe you've been working with COVID patients, doing COVID testing. And not only have you learned how to do the testing, but you've learned how to calm people's fears in the, in the face of the unknown. Okay, think about how you grew right from the gut that will tell you how it's different. Choose relevant things. Pick things that are relevant in your journey and be sure to tell us why. And know the format. This is not a resume, okay? This is a description of your journey. Avoid the fluff. Talk about this all the time. Stay away from cliches. Make your pointers. Make them clear. Summarize. If you've worked in a lab and your duties have included chromatography, et cetera, put it in a list. I worked in the lab during this time I was responsible for. In part, and this is the whole part, it's great that you've learned these techniques, but you've learned what research was about. That's what we're looking for. When you're writing your descriptions, think about, hmm, I did research, I did clinical. What am I trying to demonstrate through what I've done? Be clear and concise, because you're setting yourself up for the interviews, especially open file right now. 
Okay, so before I get to the question and answer session, and again, like I said, I wanted to leave, you know, 15 minutes or so. I just want to check to see um, here at the Princeton Review, we can help you with all aspects of this journey. So we can help you from test prep. If you're struggling in a class, especially during this whole virtual pandemic learning time, we've got tutors 24 seven to help you. And if you're really struggling with the admissions process, am I qualified? Am I ready? What do I need to write? How can I be successful? We're here to help with that. So real quickly, let me open up a poll for you guys so I can get somebody back in touch with you if you're interested in any of these. If you're interested, and again, if you're not, you don't have to respond, but if you want more information about how to better prepare for the MCAT, um, boy, that is a beast. If you want to navigate the admissions process, please let me know. My goal is to help you guys achieve and how to boost your GPA. So if you guys could just give me some sense, I'll make sure to reach back out to you guys. Got all kinds of bonuses going on right now anyway. So get your answers in. I'm going to close this poll. Y'all good? Everybody in? Do, 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 do. All right, let's get on to some more talking. So again, like I said, our job is to help you get in, be it needing to improve your grades, to get your test scores, or for admissions counseling. We got homework help, we've got all kinds of free trial with our TPR, and in the admissions counseling, we can help you with your primary. But guys, like I said, that is such a small part. We can help you with your secondary essays, your interview prep, but what the majority of the help we give is either our comprehensive counseling, which is start to finish before you get ready to apply all the way through, and premier counseling is where you guys work directly with me, and that's soup to nuts. I am at your disposal. I am the only person who does every part of your package. So we, I hope I get to talk to you, some of you guys, but for now, if you have any questions, please reach out to the Princeton Review at review.com or call 1-800-TO-REVIEW. If you have questions that I don't get to, please make sure to send them here. We'll try to get in touch with you all. Let me check my, come on, give me my questions. Why are you not working? Hold on. I'm trying guys, my questions just don't wanna answer. There we go. Technology bites sometimes. All right, let's see. In the application, are there computer automated evaluations? Sometimes they reject. Ah, so when we're talking about the evaluations, yes, sometimes rejections are done strictly on that first line if you don't meet those parameters or whatever. So there is the community that they are going to look at your AMCAS generated GPA and science GPA. And again, there is a balance of that. Guys, please remember that AMCAS does not count A pluses. So sometimes if your school uses A pluses, your GPA may be slightly lower. Um, the other thing is, I know that some schools will average like retaken courses, but you have to list every course that you took in the grade in that. Um, how would you weight the secondary essays compared to the personal statement? This totally depends on the school. Some schools ask little to nothing essay questions, whereas interestingly enough, at all of the schools I work with, we weight those secondary essays very heavily because they're targeted at the things we're looking for, be it like what the focus of our school is, um, what we're doing. So the what I always say is we're gonna do the GPAs and the MCAT screen first. We're gonna look at the experiences, make sure that makes it through our screen. Then we will, and I will tell you, the average time we spend is about two minutes per application. So that gives you some idea. We're gonna skim the personal statement to look for key interesting points that sort of signify this person gets it and it's not just something sort of spit out. Now, again, oftentimes about 50% of schools, the application is blinded, so it's not even gonna come up in, in an interview, but it may come up when you have a committee person who commits you, who presents you to our review committee to decide. 
uh, where can we find your old seminars? Oh, um, on if you go to TPR webinars, um, you can see where you can sign up for my upcoming webinars. And then if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there are links to my old webinars and my October webinar should be the first one under the Med Admissions timeline. Um, if I were to take the MCAT June 4th, but submit my primary application at the same time, would I still be considered an early applicant? Ah, excellent question, and here's my tip for that. So this is what I recommend. You're taking your, your MCAT on June 4th, okay? Submit when they open if you're ready to one super, super, super reach school, a school that you would never get into, okay? And, and that's not you know, being condescending, you school you would never get into, uh, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, something like that, okay? And that way, AMCAS can evaluate your application. We don't release to schools until the end of June, 1st of July. Again, those secondaries are almost automatically generated. So most schools don't even start looking at secondary applications until about the end of July, 1st of August, okay? So if you take your MCAT in June and you get your score back and it's like God awful atrocious and you go, I'm gonna have to retest. And even if you retest and maybe you add a few schools that are, you're outside and you retest in July, you've still got plenty of time because you can start pre-writing secondary essays, okay? And that will give you a time to get a score back and sort of know where you are. So that's why we always say sort of, if you don't have a score or you're planning to retest, because if you get your score and you go, you know what, I think I'm gonna take a gap year, you're only gonna be a reapplicant to the one school that you applied to, so it's not gonna penalize you, all right? Um, can I repeat what I meant by going through the screens? Ah, screening. So screening based on where our school is. So um, for instance, if you were thinking UNC Chapel Hill, last year their average MCAT score was 515. Their average GPA, admitting GPA was almost a 37. We're generally going to consider, if you're an in-state applicant, we're gonna consider a, a few um, MCAT points below that in our initial electronic screen and we'll hand screen a few others. We'll look for special underserved categories. If you're an out of state applicant, it needs to be at least four points above that. So we're looking for those initial screens on the school's average GPA and MCAT. You can find that on the MSAR. You can also look on individual DO websites. If you're looking at the Texas schools, you'll need to go to their websites as well. Um, and again, I posted all that information about the average screening numbers overall on my um, October webinar as well. Um, then we will screen on your experiences. And every school's different, but we're looking for a core number of service, research hours, um, clinical. If you're at a very heavy research associated school, they may expect more research hours. So again, it depends on what the target focus is for that specific school. Um, if you don't have many shadowing volunteer hours because you only realize you want to become a physician after leaving Scout and are working full time. Okay, so if you're working full time in a clinical field, what we generally say is at least 100 hours of shadowing in three to five different disciplines. It's better to have more disciplines, less hours. Like I'd rather have three to five disciplines for a total of 100 hours than 500 hours in surgery. But if you're also working in a clinically related field, that's actually gonna trump your shadowing. Now, if you're working full time in a non-clinically related field, then you may want to Old off applying. And I get people all the time going, but I'm old. Okay, first of all, I'm a dinosaur. I'm almost 57. That's old. For those of you guys who are like 25, 26, 27, ain't even close. The only time we really sort of start to think about it is when you're 38 to 40. And even then you're fine. And there are no age restrictions, but you've got to keep all that in mind because we're considering the time for residency and the time for commitment back. Um, can you include high school volunteering in a hospital if you continued in a different hospital in college? Um, no, as a general rule, it's not. It needs to be consistency in what it is. However, you can talk about it in a secondary application 
and you can refer to it in the summary. So maybe you're volunteering in a different hospital in the college. In your summary, you can write about, in high school, I volunteered for three years in a hospital, so I continued this in college, so you let us know that. Um, how do you estimate the total hours for each of your experiences? Again, we're expecting something to be a reasonable understanding um, that you're on the honor system here. We will look at it to see if your hours and what you articulate seems to be reasonable. And if it's extreme, you could get called out on it in an interview. And I have seen it happen, especially when you get tired and grumpy at um, interviewers. Do you have any advice as to how to acquire paid clinical during this time? Actually, during this time, we're getting a lot more people because things still have to continue to go on. There are virtual scribe programs right now. There are a lot of hours houring, um, advertising for that, but programs like Scribe America, Google the area that you live in just for scribe opportunities and they will come up. There are lots of them out there. Also look at potential opportunities to become an MA. Almost all of them are going to expect a minimum of one year equi um, equivalent. Generally what we say is scribe, MA, and EMT. Unless you're doing EMT like at the intermediate paramedic level, then that also carries significance. A lot of times if you're just driving the ambulance, Ambulance, although it counts for clinical and appreciating the patient experience, you don't get quite the same depth and depth of what you're doing. Um, I'm in my third semester of undergrad as a transfer student. I'm going to begin volunteering at a hospital this month. I do not have any type of certification to get clinical experience. What are the things you recommend to be doing to get that patient interaction? So this, first of all, volunteering in a hospital is great for service, for understanding the needs of that person that exists behind the patient. But it is service medical exposure. It is not considered true clinical. With that in mind, however, if in the process of that, you're working on different floors, you kind of ad hoc can observe physicians and dynamics. So we often say, let's say you volunteer for 300 hours in a hospital, you may count 75 of those hours towards shadowing and list that in your group of shadowing for the different areas you volunteer and the other as a service. But again, look for virtual shadowing opportunities, reach out to your personal physician and other physicians, ask for like half days of shadowing, things that can be manageable, or even if they're doing um, telemed, Okay, see if you can participate in a part of that through and signing HIPAA disclosures. Um, can you give some examples of good clinical experiences? Well, talked about that. Others are international mission trips. Right now, a lot of organizations like MedLife, others are offering virtual um, international mission experiences, volunteering in underserved clinics. Volunteering and working with hospice is actually considered both service and clinical if you're like in a hospice hospital or whatever. Um, let's see, working as an MA and NA. Um, right now also with COVID vaccines um, revving up, we are looking for people who are working as phlebotomists, people who are working in COVID vaccine administration, et cetera. That is also good for transcending that experience. Again, you're looking to be well-rounded. So if you can get indigent care, international health care, a blend of different specialties, and at least one, prime, it needs to be one primary care thing. Um, almost every, every program is going to ask about your understanding of the underserved and that's a great opportunity to gain insight. Um, I do not think I will get much patient interaction as a volunteer but it is still a foot in at the door of the hospital and that is very much correct and we talked about observing physicians maybe reaching out to them. Um, if I have a GPA of 3.2, is there any score I can get on the MCAT to achieve to get me through this process? Very important point here. We have looked, if you look at the numbers for people with a 3.2, for those who get an MCAT of like 519 and above, we see about a, um, a great acceptance rate. But when you fall well below that or anywhere below that, they are going to, because generally that says, okay, they understand it, there's been something else that's going on. But when you fall for MD programs at about a three, five, a three, four, five and below, you really need to think about bolstering that with master's level coursework or a master's. Um, if you're at the DO level, when you're about a three, three and below. 
Um, will lack of shadowing experience count against me? It was hard to find places to shadow in the pandemic. And we talked about this. A lot of schools, unfortunately, are saying, A, they expected you to build up on that before this time. If you are short on this and you've got others and you're combining them together and you get a bunch of virtual shadowing, you can group that in there because you won't, they won't be able to tell virtual versus non-virtual. Okay, so it's really figuring out kind of how you group it together, but it can be difficult and you may need to wait. Again, I've never had anybody take a gap year that did not say they benefited afterwards. Um, would writing about the effect of um, generational struggles be acceptable? Absolutely. Um, very, very, very much so. Those experiences about understanding the struggles of refugees, be it your family, others, yourself, is absolutely a strong point for applications. We're looking at what you're going to bring to our class. Um, I'm going to try to get through a few more of these. So if you guys want to stick around, I'm going to do like another five minutes. Do grad courses count towards science GPA? Okay, so if you took these after completing your undergrad, they are going to count as a separate GPA. If you took them as part of your undergrad curriculum, they're going to count with that. So it depends on when you took them before or after completing your undergrad degree. But yes, they can count as a separate GPA and they can count toward a science GPA. Is there any other space in the personal statement on the application to explain situations such as why um, we might have a low GPA for a semester? Um, again, I talked about this. Tons and tons of secondary applications will ask to reflect on that, and that is by far your best place. And the other thing is, guys, um, we look at overall trends in your transcript. We're not picking through every single grade on your transcript. So if we see like an early decline, we see that a lot with improvement at the end, or if we see a hiccup that replaces, we generally figure something happened and we will either ask about it in an interview if you're okay otherwise, or you'll have a chance to explain it on a secondary. Do you need to tell how many times you've taken the MCAT? You don't need to tell it. They're going to give it to you anyway. Every single MCAT is reported, be it um, every score is reported and voided scores count in your lifetime of five you're able to take. You can take it five in a lifetime unless you get special considerations and three in a year. So you have to report every score because it will be reported on your application regardless. Um, how do schools evaluate applications from international students? International students make up about 2% of our application. International students are expected to have at and above the average GPA and average MCAT for every school. So if the average is a 510 for the MCAT, we're expecting international applicants to, at that school to be at least a 512. If the average GPA is about a 36, we're expecting you to be above that. Last year, the average international MCAT was 513. Um, the, the national average was 512. The average MCAT um, GPA was about a 38. The national was about a 37 for accepted students. Um, the average acceptance for international applicants is about 2% who apply. It's about anywhere from about six to 11 percent. Um, I actually have a very high success rate with an international applicants, but it's understanding how to tailor that and what you're looking for. Um, what do you do about no shadowing hours due to COVID? Actually, I already explained that. Um, does virtual shadowing carry as much weight as scribing in person? Um, during the pandemic, it is. Um, do public health research, does public health get research get weighted as much as research in a subject? Okay, so generally um, research, we're either looking for wet lab experience or we're looking with something for clinical applications. Um, it's more about understanding the research process. So if it's more like lit review and stuff like that, it's not gonna carry as much weight. But if it's clinically related public health, it will carry as much um, weight as wet lab experience because again, you're trying to understand the research process. Um, for experiences started high school and continued to college, should we only count the college hours? No, you actually can count the college into the, hi the high school into the college hours. That's a huge benefit for that. Um, should we go about one-on-one -on -one evaluation with you? Um, do we reach out through email? Express an interest through here. My um, enrollment advisor will reach out to folks and then we can go from there.
Um, does treating patients as an acupuncturist in integrated clinics where there are NDs count similarly to medical experiences? Absolutely will be different and interesting and also instant, understands that combined approach. And I actually have a couple of acupuncturists I'm working with this year. Um, are international mission trips um, frowned upon by medical schools? Not at all. They love international mission trips. However, you have to be very careful in how you work what you do because a lot of times students will go, I had the opportunity to do teeth extractions or put in sutures. Um, there are a few very cynical, older, crotchety committee members who feel like that is, you should not be doing medicine, you're not licensed. So you have to say exposure, what you learn. You have to be careful and tiptoe around it. It's great if you get the experience. I don't frown upon it because people have worked with me in clinics internationally, but you have to be careful how you word it. Again, it's really about learning the pros and cons on all of these. Um, is it possible as a student and working to obtain some type of certificate where he is a phlebotomist or something? Absolutely. Phlebotomy certifications, getting your CNA, getting your MA so that you can get out and work directly with patients. Absolutely. EMT, phlebotomy, CNA, MA, all of those are definitely given a thumbs plus. Personal statements, you mentioned earlier that experiences should be interesting. I feel like I draw a fine line between interesting and embellishing stories. Most people do. Um, how can you make a story interesting without embellishing the details? Um, think, step back and look at it and say, would this make me want to read this further? Um, and you don't want to be over the top. I'm going to give you a perfect example. Um, I read a personal statement that was, as I stared into the gaping hole between her legs, the blood oozed as the baby crowned to be delivered. And I was like, whoa, whoa, TMI, do not want that, does not make me want to read. You can talk about that experience. You don't have to put it out there like that. But like the story I told you about the burn patient, did that not make you want to know what happened next? So again, it is, you're correct, finding that balance. Um, and that's partly why people consult our services. Um, can you double count hospice volunteering and service? We talked about that. Yes, you can. Um, I'm applying in May, just took the MCAT. If I have to retake the MCAT again, what are the last times that I could retake from my current application? Um, actually, what we generally say is if you're going to already have a score and you can submit and we see your retaking, um, middle of late June is still considered perfectly fine. How far um, undergrad GPA, master's GPA, and doctorate GPA will impact your um, admission? Um, when we're talking about master's and PhD GPAs, um, we expect you to obtain no less than a 3.5 cumulative, ideally three six, three six and above. If you're trying to overcome an undergrad GPA, you need and want to do well in your master's or PhD level classes, and that is at least a 3.5, ideally a 3.6 and above. Um, how do schools view MCAT cars? Um, it's interesting because schools differ in terms of their cars, okay? Some schools have a cutoff and they don't tell us which ones. I'm sorry, I only find that anecdotally. If you have any one section that is at the 50th percentile or below, many schools will screen you out. If your car score is less than the others, but your GPA is solid and the other scores are okay, um, and you're still in their range, and the cars is above 50th percentile, we generally don't put huge amounts of weight on that because you've demonstrated you can read. Some people, I have actually found that some of my brightest students are overthinkers on cars and that's why their, their car score is lower. Mm -hmm. If I got a 2.7 pre-med, is it better? to keep it hidden or show it. I got a three, four, and a five oh in my other courses that semester. Um, you, can't, you can't hide them. You have to show everything. Everything has to be disclosed. So that's an important part of this. Um, if I've worked in several different settings in a clinician's, um, such as traveling part time, then research setting inpatient. Could I? Could you list these in different activities? Oh, absolutely. You can list and reflect these and overlap and express the clinical aspects you've done in other settings. We actually love that because, again, when I'm checking off experiences versus the core competencies, that's where I'm looking for that weight. If you have if you graduate with two majors, is the GPA average. It is your total overall GPA in both those majors. So I guess you're saying it's average, but it's going to be your total in all your majors. Um, 
if one does not have many research or volunteer experiences in college because busy work schedule, will taking a gap year and doing volunteering and research help with that gap? Absolutely. Now, again, here is your weight, how many experiences you've had, and if you're working. So, like, if you're working full-time to support your education, so maybe you don't have as many of the others, then we'll put some weight to that, okay? But you've got to have the other experiences and you've got to have at least some service and you've got to have enough clinical. But again, I've never had a person take a gap year that it didn't benefit them. It is one year to increase your opportunities. Uh, can you shed some light on how career changer with 10 years of clinical studies and research and studies should document those hours? Exactly like that. If you've got 10 years of clinical studies, research, surgical experiences, and you're a career changer, you absolutely, and obviously that's going to be a most meaningful experience, and you talk about how that influenced your career pivot, and you absolutely, you list, we, we will be considering though, you should consider a 40 to 60 hour a week for the time that you did it we will calculate it that way um, should we talk about shadowing outside of medical physicians I shadowed an oral surgeon absolutely um, outside of your basic MD but also if you got 800 hours of dental shadowing and you changed your mind and you've only got 20 hours of clinical shadowing you need to get more clinical shadowing to make sure that we know that you you're not going to pivot again um, Peter's uh, yes, a, a 3.8 and a 3.9 and a master's PhD is absolutely fine. Does clinical research equal clinical experience? It does if it's directly patient related. If you're interacting and working with the patients, it can overlap as a clinical setting. Um, how many recommendation letters? We generally say a minimum of five. You should have at least two academic. I encourage one non-academic because a few schools ask for those. If you've done a lot of research, we'll expect to see a research letter. Clinical letters are not required, but it definitely benefits you, especially if you're applying DO, ideally a DO osteopathic letter. And if you've been heavily involved in anything, be it service, any job, anything like that, that's a good letter to have. So I generally say shoot for five, five to six, AMCAS last 10, Alpha's 10, please don't go there. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm an international student, so my first year. Oh, we absolutely have mentoring programs for international students. We have multi-year programs to counsel you all through your years, two, three, and four, with heavy discounts for those. We also offer semester and yearly subscription programs. They don't give you quite as much contact and guidance of what we do, but it also, I will tell you, those subscription programs will apply to any future purchase as well. So absolutely happy to help with that. And I like that because that lets me check in with you throughout the semester, answer questions. We have semester check-ins. We plan for other things. So absolutely. Um, life experience versus clinical shadowing. Um, I, shadowing is great. We expect to see it. But if you have true life experience, always going to trump the clinical shadowing if it is in a diversity of these areas. 15 years out of undergrad, should I still list leadership positions from undergrad or are they too long ago? It's actually a blend of both. Um, if you're 15 years out, by the way, if you're more than five years out of undergrad, most schools and you need to go school by school are going to expect you to repeat or update your prereqs. If you've been out of school for at least three years and you have your prereqs, I recommend taking at least one to two online master's classes to demonstrate you can still do the workload. Um, 15 years out of undergrad, I would prefer to see leadership in job positions you've done, but you can list undergrad experiences. I oftentimes have people group undergrad, if they're that far out, will group undergrad leadership as one category. Okay, I got a few more, so I'm going to stop as soon as I get these done. Is it worth mentioning research experience where you were a subject, maybe for money? Um, I would be reflective 
of it, you got to be careful in that. In a research experience where you can articulate that you understood the process and kind of what it means to be on that side. It's also the benefit, like if you've been in a patient, you've battled, overcome something, understanding the patient experience, or if someone in your family has had a major debilitating um, thing, that's another way to understand the impact of illness on a family. Um, how does one report the amount of shadowing hours? Again, you're going to be on the honor system and it's going to be combined. My students combine all their hours. So maybe they've shadowed from high school all the way through college and into a job. So it may be from 2017 to 2022 over X number of specialties for 400 hours. Um, if you're a research heavy school, but also a varsity athlete, will schools look past the research? Absolutely. Um, varsity athletics, full-time jobs, understanding that role, balancing work life experience, athlete life experience. I was a college athlete, so believe me, I understand that. We give a lot of credibility to that because that's part of working as a team and showing leadership. Um, can my time working as a physical therapist count toward my shadowing hours um, since I worked many years closely with physicians? Absolutely, and it can count in your paid clinical because it's working with, with um, people. Okay, so I thank you guys for letting me go about 20 minutes over, but I was able to answer all your questions. Again, we'll be reaching out to you if you expressed an interest. And um, again, if you want to go to our admissions counseling website, you can also schedule an appointment. It's down it. So if you go to the TPR medical admissions counseling, scroll all to the way to the bottom, you can special schedule an appointment to also get more questions answered. There's also a quiz at the top that will help me and um, my enrollment advisors to help us understand what you've already done before we talk to you so we can give you the best advice. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Go to the webinars page, sign up for my future webinars, and good luck to you guys. Stay safe.